Hello and welcome. I'm Tomas Eridani and this is Story Scanner. The stories that everybody is talking about in a way nobody is. A podcast based on the stories headlining Via Sarfati 25, the magazine from Bocconi University, with analysis and insights from Bocconi professors and researchers on the big topics in business, management, data science and politics. In this episode, we take a look at one of the most valuable assets of our time, data. Data is a new oil title, The Economist, in fact, a few years ago, and this seems to be the mantra of this 21st century. The confluence of several trends, including the increasing migration of socio-economic activities to the internet and the decline in the cost of data collection, storage and processing, have led to the generation and use of huge volumes of data, the big data. It is estimated data production would be 44 times greater in 2020 than it was in 2009, and the global big data market, including products, solutions and services, is expected to grow 10.6% annually from around $139 billion in 2020 to $229 billion by 2025. And these large data sets have become a core asset in the economy fostering and innovating new industries, processes and products, and creating significant competitive advantages. Data is thus now heavily influencing innovation across sectors and businesses. But just how true is it that the data is now the most valuable resource? And just like oil, raw data isn't valuable in itself. And so how should companies refine and use it to create value and innovation? Professor Torben Pedersen of Bocconi University has just published a book for Routledge on data-driven innovation and how it is the key to future success for companies, analysing the fundamental role of data and digital platforms in quickly finding pieces of innovation. Professor Pedersen has a very clear perspective on why data is so important today and how innovation can exploit this. Let's hear from him. Today, there's a massive amount of data out there. We collect store and analyze far more data than the individual mind can absorb and process. And the point is that we can learn a lot from these data. There's a lot of information hidden in these data if we explore them in a smart way through artificial intelligence. First of all, we can use these data to make much more informed decisions, both in innovation and in other business issues. You can say, Decisions without data is a little bit of guessing. So while you can say we can be on more safe ground if we base our decisions on data and you, the more and the better data, the better decisions you can say. So in this sense, data does not replace human thinking. On the contrary, it actually can enhance uh, the human, th- the human thinking. You can say, you can put it like this, that the brain is the vehicle for innovation and data is the fuel. So data-driven innovation is about all these new ways of of exploring the vast data, which is feeding back back on the way we do things, the value proposition we are offering to customers, the business models and things like that, and also the innovation process itself. In the book, he outlines some examples and the main points for companies to leverage in crafting a data-driven innovation strategy. I can give you an example from a company I have worked with. This is a telecom company that uses its vast data on, on the behavior of their customers in terms of, you can say, phone calls, text messages, how often are they calling, how long are their calls, and, 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 and things like that. And by using artificial intelligence, they become better and better in predicting which customers are the most likely to terminate their con- the contract with the company. And they can use this information to, to target those customers with special offers so, so they might be able to keep the customers. And since they have started to do that, they are losing much fewer customers in, in the company. So, so it has, they have saved them a, a lot of money also because if a telecom company, it costs much more to require new customers than it costs in order to, to keep existing customers. 
So this is just one example. Of course, there's many more examples out there that companies that use data-driven uh, uh, innovation and data-driven strategies. If I should say a little bit more generally what a company should do in order to craft a data-driven innovation strategy, I will I will point at three points. I will highlight three points. First of all, it's about changing the mindset of the company, changing the mindset in the sense that you recognize that there's this vast uh, fund of knowledge and innovation uh, ideas out in the data. So there's a lot of information outside the company that you that you uh, that is beneficial to 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 tap into. Another thing is that that companies should actually use the many data they typically have themselves uh, in a better way. Often data is companies is is, is uh, uh, hidden in different silos. So there's sales data, there's production data and so forth. And they should find a way so these speak, these data speak better to each other so they can make optimal use of them. And the final point is related to, to that companies should upgrade their skills on uh, uh, so so they can actually uh, make better use of, of this uh, all these uh, the fund of data here and this implies that they should hire people that combine IT skills with an understanding of business operation not just IT people but people that can actually understand both the the business values of the data and also is able to understand how to apply these data So there are huge possibilities, but as we mentioned, like oil, raw data needs to be searched, refined and used properly. With 2.5 quintillion bytes of data produced by humans every day, enterprises have to navigate an increasingly challenging landscape with this unstructured data. Around 80% of corporate data is unstructured needing to be selected, analyzed and processed correctly and efficiently so as to leverage them and be competitive. Professor Gaia Rubera, Amplifon Chair in Customer Science at Bocconi, studies big data and business analytics. She's going to tell us how big data has evolved in recent years, getting to this point where it is seen as the new oil. Not only has the amount of data dramatically increased in the past years, but the type of data has also changed and given us novel insights into consumer behavior. Initially, we had numbers from a variety of sources like loyalty cards, likes and shares on social networks. And firms started analyzing this data with machine learning models and inferring sensitive customer characteristics, like whether a woman is pregnant or whether someone has been using drugs. But numbers are just a small fraction of the data available to us. Think of human beings. We also gather information from words, images, and sounds. Similarly, today, companies can use this data too. We have models that can understand the topics discussed in a set of documents. And so, for instance, we can understand what elements of a firm's product or service drive customer satisfaction and which ones instead just drives customer crazy. Or uh, we can track how a conversation about a brand or a politician evolves over time. We have uh, neural networks that can analyze images and identify, for instance, uh, brand logos. We can then use this data to identify, for instance, images posted on social networks like Instagram and observe how consumers use a firm's products as well uh, when, where, and uh, what other brands they are uh, using. And finally, we can analyze audio data, which uh, right now seems to be the next big thing. And what's interesting about audio data is that uh, we can, we as human beings, we can better sense the emotions of uh, people talking than by just uh, reading the words or watching them. That means that audio data opens the door to brand new types of analysis. And in the future, we could segment and target the consumers according to their mood in the specific moment they interact with the organization. And it is important that companies are aware of the different sources for extracting competitive advantage from data. Professor Rubea outlines them to us. 
we can observe uh, three different sources of uh, competitive uh, advantage. Initially, data was a scarce resource, and whoever had the skills to harvest them held a competitive advantage. And we saw several startups whose main business model was aggregating data from different sources and selling them. For instance, Wisecout is an Italian startup that offers comprehensive video coverage of soccer games all around the world. They sell this data to scouts of professional teams who can now discover new talent while sitting behind their computers. And over time, more and more firms developed the skills to harvest data or started producing data themselves, such that data is no longer a scarce resource. Hence, we observed the source of a competitive advantage switched from owing the data to analyzing it. This is the reason why we have seen an increasing interest in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and why data scientists are so much in demand these days. However, we can safely assume that in the near future, all companies that survive in the market will have the data and the capability to analyze it. Hence, the real source of a competitive advantage will be how to innovate with the unique data that each company produces. The best example here is probably Spotify, which from the names of the playlist that we play, know, for instance, when we are running, when we are driving, when we are sad, we are happy, we are having coffee, and they sell this data. So the real source of competitive advantage in the future is going to be using a company's product as the Trojan horse to produce unique data that just the company has it because it produces it through its own products and find the innovative ways of unbundling this data and sell them and probably create a new business model for the company itself. So while we have seen that big data technologies and analytics are often associated with driving innovation and superior performances, firms investing big data can often fail to attain these advantages. In a recent Boston Consulting Group survey, only 16% of manufacturing executives said that their company had captured value from data and analytics, despite 81% saying they had implemented at least one data and analytics use. Bocconi's professor Gabriele Troilo has written a paper on how and when do big data investments pay off, grounded in the marketing context, analyzing the relationship between big data marketing affordances and service innovation. In the paper, he outlines the general secret to making these investments pay off. Here he tells us more. Most of the managers and the entrepreneurs with whom I had interactions, they expressed a big frustration for the fact that their investment did not pay off. So we started investigating if there were any condition that could favor the payoff of big data investments. And so we we had two basic uh, research steps. The first one qualitative and the second one quantitative that confirmed that companies that were able to get higher returns on investments in big data technology and analytics were very good in changing their organizational culture in order to enable the results of the big data technology and analytics. So basically, we discovered that these companies were able to enact in their employees some abilities that we called affordances. And there were three of them very relevant in our results. The first one is what we call customer behavior pattern spotting. That is to say the ability to map customer behaviors through the help of big data to identify patterns and routines. The second one is what we call market, real-time market responsiveness. That is to say the ability to immediately design and implement response to market data in real time. And the third one is what we called data-driven market ambidexterity. That is to say the ability to match data regarding current markets with data regarding potential opportunities, new opportunities for new markets or new markets to be created. So companies that were able to 
activate these three abilities, we're also able to have higher payoffs for the, for the investments in, in big data technologies and analytics. Uh, the second thing that we discovered that this uh, investment uh, pay off in two different ways. So the ability of what we call customer behavior pattern sporting is basically turning into efficiency of current processes. And so it is impacting returns in terms of higher efficiency. Whereas uh, real-time market responsiveness and data-driven market ambidexterity are able to increase the level of service innovation and so the effectiveness of the actions that turns into higher uh, effectiveness also in terms of uh, returns on big, big data investments. Professor Troilo has also some sharp ideas on some more specific tips for managers to read the benefits of big data investments. From this, from the findings of our research, uh, we can suggest a few uh, courses of actions to managers and entrepreneurs. The first one is to shift efforts from data to actions. So the frustration of many managers and entrepreneurs is due to the fact that they rely too much on the investment on data, forgetting that the next step is much more relevant. It is to say, acting on the base of the data and the analytics they uh, invested on. So uh, big data represent a potential that to be actualized requires organizational changes and the development of the abilities that I mentioned in, in, the, in the previous part. The second thing is that the return on investment is not a one way. I mean, there are different ways to get these returns on investment. One is through operational efficiency that is linked to the ability of customer behavior pattern spotting. On the other side, the second avenue is more based on effectiveness through service innovation, given by the development of the abilities of real-time market responsiveness and data-driven ambidexterity. There is another tip that uh, I think we can provide companies and managers with is to try to align the uh, big data strategy with the digitalization stage of the industry. In fact, our results show that in early stages of digitalizations, companies may profit more from operational efficiency, whereas in industries, uh, that already reached a development stage of digitalization, the effectiveness given by service innovation, data-driven service innovation is much more impactful in terms of returns. And my final uh, tip to managers and entrepreneurs is to be open to the unexpected. There is uh, too much emphasis, in my opinion, to the predictive abilities uh, due to big data investments, whereas big data can provide uh, companies with unexpected insights that can uh, design, can allow to design uh, an avenue to completely new opportunities into the market. So being open to the unexpected is for sure one effect that can be very fruitful and impactful uh, out of big data investments. So we have heard how there are big opportunities for companies to exploit data to extract valuable insight and enhance their strategies and innovation. But also that it is not enough to simply invest in data to reach and maximize that added value. Companies should take a series of measures to leverage data at best, starting from changing the mindset and organizational culture to using the right data and tools efficiently, through to developing specific skills and strategies and processes. Thanks for joining me and our guests in this episode of Story Scanner. You can read more about these and other data-driven innovation stories in the new issue of Via Sarfati 25 magazine, with opinion, research and insights from Bocconi professors and researchers. I am Tomasio Redani, and I hope you'll join me again for the next episode of Story Scanner. <laughs>